associated uh, with little things like the culture itself uh, because I felt like they made fun of me having to, my mom used to put coconut oil on my hair uh, and uh, she would send me to school and they would make fun of it and say I was smelly. Uh, they, I, could, I didn't dare speak the Indian language because they would make fun of it. And so I stuck to Chinese friends and Chinese people and disobeyed my mother at all cost. Uh, didn't want to go to, I, I was totally not religious. Uh, you know, we came from a Hindu family, but I disregarded it. I became a Christian instead uh, because I thought was, uh, you know, I was better accepted. But there was a lot of these kind of conflicts, uh, my sexuality. So there was a lot of these things growing up in Singapore. Uh, I think uh, repressed me quite a bit, uh, so uh, which I was not able to really speak up. So I didn't have a voice. So when I started making films, thirty when I was thirty, uh, it was actually a, you know it took me a long time because I'm not schooled in film. I did not go to film school or ever think that I was going to make a film. I had these stories in my head, and my first film, it's called I Can't Sleep Tonight, came about because I was moonlighting. In Little India, there's a place in in, uh, in Singapore. They have Little India. They have Chinatown. They have a, 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 a Malay uh, location as well, where a lot of the Malays congregate. Uh, so for food and things like that. So in Little India, I was working at night as a night auditor, and uh, they, uh, and there were uh, illegal workers, uh, people from Sri Lanka seeking asylum. Uh, in, you know, they were in transit, waiting to go to Europe running away from their country. There were sex workers who would knock at the hotel door bleeding, asking me to help them from their pimps. And I used to open the door and let her sleep. And I would let the illegal workers come in and sleep for the night and uh, listen to these stories from Sri Lanka. So that's how my first film came about because the guy used to say, I can't sleep tonight. And so I wrote, because I couldn't sleep because I was at work. And I wrote my first short story, a short film, uh, on, a, on a page that night and I titled it I Can't Sleep Tonight. So that's how it all began for me. Uh, a lot of personal stories, a lot of things that I felt came out in my films. Um, so uh, I don't, I mean, it, it's too long to talk about. I, I had a lot of gaps and doubts and fear about making films because I didn't have that expertise which came from being schooled. So, you know, uh, after making four films and winning four awards, I stopped. Uh, I made a, even made a film about a relationship between a Singapore and an illegal worker. That was my uh, film that I made in the 90s, uh, which every one thought was a homoerotic film, uh, just because of the images. Maybe it's a subconscious thing uh, that I, you know, that was within me that was coming out in the frames that I was uh, doing in the film. So uh, these are things that I, uh, I got scared when people started reading too much into my films and no, trying to get to know me better. And I was afraid of that and I stopped making for 10 years. I said, no, I can't do this, it's too personal. So 10 years later, uh, in 2007, a group of young people, including Jun Fong, who you're gonna, uh, I don't know whether you're gonna mm -hmm. meet him uh, later on tonight, he was in his 20s at that time, this was 10 years ago, they came together to make an Omnimas film called Lucky Seven. And they invited me, I was the only one who was already in my 40s. And I said, what am I going to do with these young people? You know, they're asking me to make a film with them. So I went into a trance and wrote a very, a film that I would, actually I like very much because it had no story. It was totally experimental and surreal. It was so, I pushed it to the limit, thinking that I had to be challenged with all these young people. And it came out to be something else which nobody understood, which nobody knew what I was doing even on set. Uh, my producer kind of gave up. The actor wanted to stop acting in the film uh, because I made him do terrible things. I mean, not terrible things to me, but you know, just things that he couldn't imagine. But eventually I told him, you'll be a better actor if you did it. And he was convinced and he did it. And uh, I was realized that when it went to Rotterdam, uh, the programmers liked it a lot and invited me separately to Oberhauser in Germany. So it, it, it opened a certain and I realized I could make films like that and get away with it, you know, and where I didn't have to talk about it. Nobody knew what I was doing. Nobody connected it with who I am because I had nothing to do with it, almost, you know. They, they, they couldn't connect me with the film. Uh, so these are things that I do, and it's, it's very good because, I'm, you know, then I learned this. So with this feature film, it's, 
you know, your first feature film, it, it's different. It's very hard to really get away and try to do something which, you know, with a kind of a, to be detached from it, yeah? So I think that's why there are a lot of elements in it which I strongly feel issues that, uh, that bother me, uh, that kind of came out of the film, uh, which, yeah, I'm happy about. I hope I've answered your question. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you came to make this film. So was it difficult to make this sort of film in a, a Singapore film? Yeah, um, I mean, I got a grant from the government, Singapore Film Commission. Uh, I'm very happy they gave me a grant when I pitched the story. Of course, I didn't tell them everything. <laughs> uh, but they were totally fine with it. They eventually saw the film. They, when we presented it in Cannes, they were very proud that they celebrated both the films that you, that is being screened here. Uh, Singapore was flying high because it had two films. Uh, you know, from such a small country, two films in Cannes was a big deal, uh, and you know it was they were it was a proud moment for SFC. And I think I really appreciate what they did by not trying to censor it. It was not censored. In fact, I censored my own film. There are scenes in there. It was two and a half hours long. Uh, but the French uh, said that if I ever want this to be screened, it, I should cut it uh, uh, to within two hours. If not, the cinemas are not going to take it. But I censored a lot of the... Uh, there were scenes of... Uh, blow, uh, there was a blowjob scene, which I thought was not necessary. Uh, yeah, although I filmed it, uh, and I eventually censored it. There were a lot of scenes where she takes a pee in the forest. I wanted it really like how they would do it in... in how you know really see them live in this forest and there was this kind of interactions which I I actually took out just to tighten the film uh, because everyone thought it was too long I would have left it uh, but it's something that I had I did myself and not the f uh, film commission they didn't object to anything so uh, I think um, in order for me to uh, make this film I was uh, given that kind of freedom, but it was a very long process writing the script because it, you know, it it really took a lot of time, and I was very grateful that it went to different labs uh, for the script. Went to different labs, and it helped me because I had script doctors with my co-writer Jeremy, and they they actually helped us a lot. So it went to uh, Ties at Bind in, in uh, Italy. It went to Cannes Sin Foundation where I actually met my co-producer, French co-producer. I was allowed to pitch the script again and again. Uh, and then I went to Berlin uh, as well with the script. And so it was all uh, these, you know, it kind of helped shape the story uh, quite a bit. Uh, so I was very fortunate to have these opportunities for this script, uh, or just based on the script uh, before I created the film. So that journey was, uh, it was not easy, it was quite long. Uh, you know, you, you can give up almost, but I'm glad I, I didn't, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, um, thank you uh, for a wonderful film. Uh, if I may be allowed, I'll say a few things before I ask the question. Sure. As I invited, um, of course I'm, I'm the organizer of the event. <laughs> I invited uh, Raj to come here precisely because I saw this film for the first time at the Asian Film Festival here in Hong Kong last year. And I was really struck by it because I feel that you have not only shown you know, the racial dynamics and talk about in Singapore that of course I'm also familiar with uh, because I grew up there, but I think you have also shown the new side of Singapore, like you say, these new migrants that are coming into, into Singapore. So, so that for me was, was really interesting. Um, and I, I still remember, you know, 20 years ago when I left Singapore, I went to a conference where a sociologist said that in Singapore, everybody feels minoritized. You know, of course I sympathize with what you said. You know, I, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be an Indian minority in Singapore, being the Chinese majority myself. Uh, but even when I'm in Singapore, you know, taxi drivers tell me that I am not Singaporean because of the way I speak Mandarin. You know, nobody speaks Mandarin like that in Singapore. I was told I was being told all the time, right? So, so there's this, so there's this question of perception, right? With all these newcomers and and, and what have you, uh, and all this changing racial landscape. And the other thing that really struck me about your film is precisely 
what you said about the, the landscape, uh, the actual physical landscape, because we know Singapore as a, and then Hong Kong as you know skyscrapers and all this public housing, which you show quite a bit in the film. But that side of the reservoir is, is, a, is a view that I think very few foreigners would associate with Singapore. So, so uh, I would really like to hear you talk a bit more about the whole design of the film, because uh, what really struck me is the, um, the sound design is, is really interesting, um, and also the lighting, you know, is very dark for most parts of the film, which actually makes it very difficult for audience, I think, to watch and to follow. So, so taking the, the, the notion of darkness, <laughs> literally, in terms of lighting, yeah, I'm just wondering whether you could share a bit more um, on the thinking behind the whole production process in terms of you know production design, uh, both on the sound and the lighting, and the use of music as well. Is this quite haunting? I'm not sure whether it's an electronic sound that goes through, that overlaps with, with the natural sound. And, you know, can you say a bit more about those? Sure. Um, I'll go with the sound first. Okay, uh, the post-production was done in Paris. I, I met Roman Dimini two years ago before the film. Uh, I, I made the film because he, we were in Cannes and I was introduced to him by the French producer. And he was a very quiet person. He was a, he's not actually a designer, he's a musician. Uh, and uh, he was doing a film with uh, Naomi Kawasaki uh, from Japan and uh, he had just, the film was in Cannes and that's why he was there. And I loved the film and the music in it. Uh, so I told him that I would like to work with him. And so when, when this project came along, I actually asked him whether he would work uh, on the film and he agreed. And uh, that's amazing thing about uh, Roman. He's Polish, uh, living uh, but French born. Uh, and he said to me that don't tell me about the story. Uh, he, didn't, he was not interested in the film or the story or anything like that. He wanted me to just talk about myself. Uh, you know, he wanted to get to know me better. Uh, so we had a lot of these sessions, which, uh, and he's a very difficult person to talk to because he speaks very softly for a person who does sound, and you have to strain to really listen to him. Uh, but we had a, long, a lot of these long conversations about life, about literature, about the kind of books I read, the music I listened to. and So that was our conversation. And so when we started make, uh, doing the film, I, I actually didn't want any music or sound for the film. I said I didn't want to manipulate anybody, especially the audience, to watch the film or feel anything. Uh, I wanted it very raw. So the only instruments that, you know, the only thing that I kind of uh, uh, used was that funeral sound that, that the, from the troupe itself. And I think at very few places did he create some kind of a sound design, and I specifically told him to. And uh, the, the sound of the birds, uh, we had shot the birds and it was the natural sound of the birds. And we enhanced it in different places where I felt that the sound of birds could be used because the whole idea of the bird, you know, they said to me, you title it yellow bird, where, but where is the yellow bird, right? So I was thinking, I don't want to put a yellow bird in it. But they said, no, you know, come on, you know, like, so I said, if I put a yellow bird in it, it has to be dead. <laughs> so they were like, why? You know, why must it die? I said, that's hope for me. You know, it's dead. So if it comes in the film, it has to die. But, you know, I had a reason for it, you know. But, you know, this is the terrible thing about having it all in you. And then you have to explain it, which I don't like. I hate explaining it to people when I'm doing it. It's like, now I can talk, right? <laughs> it's so easy. But at the time, I was so agitated that they were asking me these questions. But for me, the bird, uh, where it came, was very important. Uh, it was important because uh, if you see the image, who could, you know, everyone thought they were the, the, the actors. They thought that they were the, she, like, she thought she was a yellow bird. She wrote to me when I, when I sent the actress a script, she wrote back to me from China. She said to me, oh, I think I'm the yellow bird. So I said, great. You know, uh, but she was one, and her name was Huang Lu. You know, so the yellow idea and the the uniform that they wore for the troop was not planned. The troop that I chose, who agreed to work with us for free for the film, uh, they their uniforms were yellow, and they had this feather, this yellow feather, and I was like shocked. 
It's like, oh no, now everyone's thinking that's planned. It wasn't planned. So she appears in it with the yellow feathers, right? So it sort of helped her think that she was a yellow bird anyway. She was a great actress. Uh, and um, so the bird, like, you know, the tent, those were things that I designed. I'm going to like jump a bit. So the product, I wanted these tents like a bird in a, in a little cage in the forest, in its natural environment. And I wanted him to bring food to her, like how you would feed a bird, you know? Like he brings food and leaves it there for the bird to eat. So these are the images that came to me when I was thinking about the film, about how I would present the bird. And I wanted the bird to be shot out of its natural habitat, just when he's thrown out of the house. And the bird dead there was actually to preempt the daughter, uh, that, you know, that whole thing was going to come. And will it, is she alive? Is she dead? Is something happened to her? Is she hurt? So I was allowing that to happen subconsciously for the audience. Uh, whether you connect it or not, it doesn't matter to me, but you know, I just laid it out there in that part of the film. And when you see her, you know, he's taking her out of a cage. And I left the door open for him to enter out and I held the shot there for a bit because I wanted them to see like as though a bird flew out of its cage. Uh, so these kind of elements which he's talking about, like the lines in the forest. So the photographer, the cinematographer shot these lines as well uh, of the trees, which are like bars, you know. So these tens, bars, these are things that we 